This audio presentation of Journeying Onward by Lillian D. Waters is brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com, copyright 2014, all rights reserved. Preface For those who are hungering after a better understanding of God, and for those who need to be led to Christian science, this book is sent into the world. The author wishes to state emphatically that the truth contained herein have been gained wholly through an earnest study of the Bible and of the writings of Mary Baker Eddy, the beloved founder of the modern Christian science movement originally founded by Christ Jesus. Christian science is taught in the Christian science textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, and it would be impossible for one to simplify or amplify the truth contained therein. Hence the author's purpose in sending forth this little book is neither to teach nor to explain that which our dear leader has given to the world, but is sent forth with a simple wish that it may find a welcome in answering some of the questions which were perplexing to the author and which may be perplexing to thousands of others brought up under the type of religious teaching which have been widely prevalent in recent centuries and are largely followed to present. Lillian D. Waters Certainly we believe in the Bible, said the Christian scientist, as she looked into the face of a minister whom she had recently met, as their train was rapidly speeding along on its journey. There never was so inconsistent a people, began the minister, as Christian scientists. They twist passages in the Bible to suit themselves, and declare that there is no such thing as sickness, sin, and death, while all around us are those who are weary, heavy laden with sickness, in the depth of despair, and dying in countless numbers. Pausing a moment, he went on, they tell the poor that there is no poverty, the sick that there is no pain, and they console the mourner with the statement there is no such thing as death. Have you finished, said the girl, and as she turned her face toward him, he saw a smiling face, a glow with health and animation, and he noted the bright, joyous expression. No, he replied, I have much that I would like to say to you, and if I am wrong in the thoughts which I have expressed, I would indeed be grateful if you would correct me. The scientist was glad to hear the ring of sincerity in his voice. I do not believe in arguing, she returned, but when one asks for information regarding Christian science, I am glad, as far as I am able to correct any erroneous ideas which he or she may have on the subject. As I said to you, we believe in the Bible, but let us reason together and see if we cannot untangle some of these apparent inconsistencies. Of course, you are familiar with the first chapter of Genesis. Well, I have been reading it for forty years, answered the minister. Very good, said the girl, with an amused look. Who is spoken of in this chapter as our only creator? God. Has there been any other creator? Never. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, replied the minister, quoting from the first chapter of John. Yes, agreed the scientist, everything was created, and God's work was finished, so that nothing was made after that, for you know it reads, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So we have a list in this chapter of all that God made. It was all good, and his work was finished. Certainly, returned the minister, we agree precisely. I see no point of difference there. But perhaps you may, said the girl with a little nod. Man was created spiritually, male and female. Is there any record there of sin, sickness, and death being attached to him? Well, no, with a little uneasiness. Do you know of any medicines created or specified for man? No, but... Now we have no buts, but yet, said the girl, smiling, you admit then that God did not create sin, sickness, and death, and did not provide material remedies for man's welfare and comfort. Well, there is no record made of it there, began the minister, but we know that sin came with the serpent, and surely he continued with spirit. There is enough of medicine, of sickness and death around you to know that they exist, and you have just said that God is the only creator. Yes, she replied thoughtfully. I have been led to see and to prove that truth. You acknowledge that God made all, and that there is no record of sickness in the record of creation. Now will you tell me if he made all and pronounced all good, and if there is no other creator who created sickness? Her steady, clear gaze made him feel that he was in a corner, but endeavoring to appear at ease, he hastened to speak. Suppose we should admit, for the sake of argument, that God did not create sickness. Even then we must acknowledge that he allows or permits it, for the furtherance of good in his people, or for the sake of bringing them closer within the bounds of his infinite love and compassion. If God does not create sickness, said the Christian science slowly, where does he get it in order to send it upon his children? The man plainly looked embarrassed. Why, he began, that is a very queer way of looking at it. I had never thought of it in that light, but he continued, there is a power, you must admit, which we call evil. Do you mean a personal devil? questioned the girl. 
Well, er, fumbling with his coat lapel, feeling he might be entrapped again, why, yes. Who made him? inquired the girl. Why, evil has existed since the beginning of the world. But, exclaimed the girl, you have already admitted that God made all, everything, and that it was good. The minister felt that he was getting none the best of this fair companion, but he replied in good faith, Well, of this I am sure, that evil and sin exist. If they did not come from God, they must proceed from some other source. Yes, we agree there, said the girl warmly, but our point of difference is with regard to the source. In your religion, do you believe that God does not send sickness, asked the minister. Yes, answered the girl, if I thought that God sent sickness, I should not try to get well, for it would not be wise for me to try to get rid of anything that God wanted me to have. In fact, it would be a sin. Hmm. Do you think that God allows or permits sickness, continued the man, his voice betraying his interest. I have been fully convinced that he does not, answered the scientist. How could God, the only creator, be conscious of that of which he is not the author? You do not mean to say, exclaimed the minister, that you believe that the all-knowing knows nothing of our sickness, pain, and sorrow. Yes, answered the girl, that is what I believe. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Quoting the familiar verse to him, Feeling that the minister had a goodly list of questions on hand, after a moment's thought, the scientist remarked in a gentle way, I would not have you believe that I am didactic. As you ask your question in good faith, I can but answer them, but I cannot forbear telling you that you will find the answers to all your questions in the Christian Science textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, written by Mary Baker Eddy. I have answered your questions only through the understanding I have gained by an earnest study of the book. I promise to bear that in mind, if you will but go on with the conversation. I am sure you will not refuse to talk with me if I assure you that I really had a great desire to gain information regarding the number of questions of the minister, in an appreciative tone. I believe I was going to ask you before you interrupted me, he went on eagerly, since God knows everything, why does he not know sickness? Feeling now that the right understanding existed between them, and remembering that happy hour when someone had lovingly pointed out the way to her, she hastened to answer. You know, love is not conscious of hate, truth does not know a lie, and light does not recognize darkness. So God, who fills all space, can know nothing but his own glorious brightness. But you cannot tell the sick that God knows nothing of their pain, the sinner that God knows nothing of his sin, and the mourner that God knows nothing of his loss. Through the teaching of Christian science, we have learned to tell the sick that God is love, filling all space, and that man, as the image of God, is spiritual and perfect, that in God man lives, moves, and has his being. Hence he reflects and manifests only what is in God, and the sick are healed. To the sinner we say, come learn of God, who knows man only as his perfect child. Learn that sin has no power to bind man. Learn through Christian science how to exercise dominion over sin, to loathe it, and to find that man is master and not the servant of sin. The minister was listening with great eagerness, but he noticed that she was looking at him, yet far beyond him, as she continued. The mourner learns in Christian science that God is life, and that life cannot cause death. He learns that the Heavenly Father does not snatch the babe from his mother's loving arms, nor make the infant fatherless. He learns that joy, happiness, harmony, life, and peace are the only real, true, normal condition of man. Do you believe, then, interrupted the minister, that God does not take the babe to himself, does not call the father home, in fact, that God does not take us from this sin-sick world to rest in peace? I believe that God is not the author of death, answered the girl, that he does not cause it nor permit it any more than the principle of mathematics causes one to make a mistake in addition. Do you want me to believe, exclaimed the man, that if this train should be wrecked and I should be killed, God would not take me to his eternal home? Do you think that an accident could push you into the kingdom of heaven, returned the scientist quickly? We live in eternity now. We partake of heavenly bliss, only as we learn to destroy sickness, sin, and death in the manner that the dear Master taught us. Death never transferred anyone into heaven, for death, you remember, St. Paul said, is an enemy. The calm, sweet voice of the talker made him provoked at his own irritability over the last words he had heard, yet he could not refrain from begging her to go on with her explanation. People have been taught to say, Thy will be done, the scientist continued in answer to his question, and instead of knowing that God's will is health, 
harmony and eternal life, they think that it is God's will for them to be on bed of pain and afterwards to be taken from their loved ones. Does it please God to have man suffer years of agonizing pain in order to prepare him for heaven, or to kill a man by some inconceivable brutal accident in order to usher him into harmony? I was amazed and pained the other day when I saw a little boy gaze out the window as a funeral procession was going by. He ran to his mother exclaiming, Oh, Mama, God has killed someone else. The mother looked at me, horrified, to hear a boy express such a thought. She explained to me that a few days previous one of her son's little playmates had died, and of course she had told her boy that God had taken him. How natural it was then for the child to think as he did. Then again I read the other day of a man taking a quantity of poison, supposing it to be cough medicine. Afterwards it appeared in the obituary, whereas it hath pleased God to take our beloved brother. Yet within a few weeks the family brought a suit against the druggist for not labeling the bottle correctly. Can you not see the utter inconsistency? asked the girl earnestly. It reads in Job, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Can you tell me how Christian science explains that? he said in reply to her question. In proportion as we know God is life, truth, and love, we receive happiness, peace, and health. While sorrow, discord, and sickness are taken away from us, are destroyed, said the girl simply. As I un-understand the Bible now, she continued, lovingly clasping her Bible in her hand, I know it does not mean that, because God gives us life. He therefore claims or exercises the right to take it from us at any moment. You must know that God cannot make a mistake. What he gives us is given forever, and nothing in the whole universe can take it from us. You know it says in the Bible, Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. Through Christian science, I have been enabled to see that it is only our ignorance of God that makes us believe that we lose health and life, for the right understanding of God proves that man is forever at one with him, reflecting all that is in him and nothing else. Pausing a moment, she asked, For what purpose was Jesus sent into the world? He came to save sinners, yet you say there is no sin, said the minister, thinking now that he was scoring a point. Jesus was the way and we can gain the right understanding of God only as we follow in his steps. The Master was our highest instructor of truth. He came to save us from believing in sin, sickness, and death, and those who are following in his steps are destroying these conditions, as he did, and are giving God the glory. But, interrupted the minister, do you scientists not declare that you heal the sick? No, she replied quickly, God truth is the only healer of sick. The scientist must know the truth in order that the manifestation of sickness may be removed. The scientist is only the channel through which the truth reaches the patient. As this pane of glass, she said, tapping the window on her side, is the medium through which the light of sun reaches us. But, protested the minister, if God knows nothing of sickness, how can he heal it? Surely one cannot destroy that which he knows nothing about. Understanding does not know ignorance, replied the scientist, yet it destroys it nor does light have to know darkness in order that darkness be removed. Darkness cannot exist in the presence of light, so sin, sickness, and death cannot remain with one who has gained the spiritual light, the true understanding of God. I understand you to say that there is no sickness, persisted the man. The girl did not seem at all disturbed by his persistency or by his manifested interest, but replied with great patience to all his questions. I admit that sickness seems real to the sufferer, Yet it is not a reality, a truth, a right or normal condition of man. It is not real or eternal, because it can be destroyed only that exists as a reality, which cannot be destroyed. Black, you know, is not admitted to be a color, for it reflects no light. We know that the condition called sickness exists all around us, as you say, but the truth of God, as revealed to the world through Mrs. Eddy, removes this condition, and the real, harmonious fact of health appears in its stead. Now, do you mind telling me, asked the minister, where you are taught whence sickness comes? He was determined to get to the root of the matter. Jesus virtually called sickness the work of the devil, answered the girl, for you remember he came to destroy the works of the devil, and he frequently destroyed sickness. But you believe that there is no devil. The only devil that one may know is the belief of evil in one's own thought, returned the girl quietly. Then, do you mean to say that sickness can be traced back to one's own consciousness, the minister questioned. 
I have learned, answered the girl, that fear, ignorance, and sin promote sin, sickness, and death, that their cause exists in the human mind, and it has been proven, she added positively, that their cure is by the divine mind. On what basis do you argue that sin is the cause of sickness, pursued the minister? You will remember Jesus' word to the impotent man, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee and to the sick of the palsy, for whether is it easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk? Yes, replied the man thoughtfully, but you will remember too that Jesus said, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. He declared that the sick needed a physician, rather than one to tell them of their sin. I am surprised, returned the scientist gently, that a minister should understand that chapter so little as to neglect considering Jesus' explanation of those words. For in that very next verse he adds, But go ye and learn what that saying meaneth, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It is the true physician who heals the sin as well as the sickness, who removes the cause, rather than spends his time in trying to remove the effect. It is a Christian act to clothe and comfort the poor, but is it not more Christ-like to heal a disease which causes the poverty? You may console one who is fearful that some disease is developing in the system, yet is it not more Christ-like to destroy the fear in that person's thought, thereby preventing the development of the disease? You are bound to meet everyone of my arguments, aren't you? laughingly exclaimed the minister. Of course, I cannot now agree with all that you say, yet there seems to be a world of truth in it all, he added thoughtfully. Now I would like very much to talk to you about prayer. I have heard so many times that you people do not pray, at least that you do not pray as we do. Which would you think prayed the more understanding, the man who besought God to direct him to a climate that would help him to get rid of some disease, or the man who had been enabled to understand God well enough so that he could live in any climate, since God is everywhere, the man who trusts the physician to heal him, or the one who relies absolutely upon God, attributing to him alone all power? But we place God behind the physician, he exclaimed. And we place God before the physician, the girl returned. Yes, the minister said very thoughtfully, as if the admission cost him something. Certainly the results with Christian scientists bring out their own lives, speak for themselves. But how are you taught to pray in Christian science if you do not pray as we do? You see, the girl exclaimed, you and I have different conceptions of God. Yes, I begin to see that, admitted the man good-humoredly. The much-magnified man thought of God is a thing of the past to us. It says on page 140 of our Christian Science textbook, The Christian Science God is universal, eternal, divine love, which changeth not, and cause no evil, disease nor death. So I am learning through this book that God is an infinite, perfect, changeless being, having all power, all knowledge, and filling all space. Do you never think of God as having personality, the minister asked. Can you limit the infinite, returned the girl, to place or space? God is a living principle, controlling, maintaining, and governing man and the universe harmoniously. Some people pray to God for some desired thing and immediately wonder whether they will receive it or not. They argue with themselves that it could not come this way or that until they are convinced that it would be impossible for it to come at all. The girl paused, but the minister looked at her to go on. Jesus said, Have faith that whatsoever ye ask for in prayer is already granted you, and it will be yours. This is as it appears in the 20th century New Testament. Jesus also said, All that the Father hath is mine. Many a man begs and pleads with God to answer his prayer, as child pleads with his father to grant a certain request. No prayer uttered since the world began has ever changed God, since he is unchangeable, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Christian science prayer is a realization of possession, rather than a thought of need. We are taught to affirm, as children of God, as heirs of him, that man possesses that which God possesses, his goodness, his abundance, his power. His strength, his infinite blessings are ours now. By knowing this, and by scientifically declaring that their opposites, sin, poverty, sickness, and misery, are false because they are not in God, and do not testify of Him, by scientifically understanding these spiritual truths, we are brought into such a consciousness of the allness of God, that we behold and receive the manifestation of our desires or prayers. Go on, he said, as the girl hesitated. I love to hear you talk. You are a veritable preacher. You have not always had this idea of God. The girl shook her head regretfully. 
When I was a child, I used to wonder how God could ever hear so many prayers. If a million people were praying at the same time for a million different things, I wondered how could he ever hear them, let alone answer them. I know you can explain it now, said the minister eagerly. The principle of mathematics, the girl replied, so beautifully illustrates the principle of life. Should a million people sit down at the same time and call upon the principle of mathematics to help them work out a problem, they would find it ready to help each of them bring about the correct answer, just as if only one were using that principle. So it is with us. We can each bring our problems to the divine source of all knowledge, whether they be problems of sickness, sin, or discord, and by applying through the teaching of Christian science the correct rules, the right answers or results are attained. In solving a problem in mathematics, should we fail to get the correct results, we should not sit down and ask or beseech the principle to help us, nor should we find fault with the principle and rules and seek to change them. We should know at once that the fault was wholly within ourselves, that the failure was occasioned by some mistake in our work or because we did not sufficiently understand the necessary steps. Then do I understand that you do not ask God for anything but simply endeavor to do the work yourself, questioned the minister. Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. God's work is finished. We try to see so clearly the scientific truth that good fills all space, that all errors or mistakes go out of our thought and consequently their manifestations disappear. Yet I cannot see why you do not ask for things, said the man, desiring to be satisfied. You would not sit down at a table filled with food and beg for something to eat, would you? Nor would you sit in a room flooded with light and ask that you might be able to see. No. So, the girl concluded, we realize that abundance of blessing is now within our reach, and instead of longing for them and weeping because we think they are not ours, we have learned how to partake of them. Then you do not put your prayer thoughts into words, he pursued earnestly. Silently and mentally we commune with our Father, Mother God, the girl replied gently. We do not seek to bring God to us, but we go to God. We strive to be in tune and touch or harmony with divine love, that we may behold the finished work. This scientific mental work leads one heavenward. After a moment's thought, she went on, Suppose that you are in the water and that you pull on a rope which someone on the shore throws you. As you pull on the rope, it might seem to you as if you were bringing the shore near, instead of you drawing near the shore. Thus our nearness to God is wholly due to our drawing nigh to Him by gaining a better understanding of Him. Yes, assented the man brightly. I certainly understand that. After a pause, he asked, what about your failures? As I illustrated in solving mathematical problems, replied the scientist quickly, so in our journey Godward, should the right result not be immediately apparent, it is not because God is wrong, nor because Christian science is not true, but because we have either not been sufficiently obedient, or because we have not sufficient understanding. What do you mean by being sufficiently obedient, continued the minister with interest. We have rules given us in the book of life which we must follow in order to attain the desired results in health, harmony, and happiness. And she concluded earnestly, We have these rules interpreted to us clearly in our textbook, Science and Health, that every man, woman, and child can prove in some degree their truth. Having that book, you have not much use for a minister's prayers, have you? said the minister jokingly. I used to know a minister, replied the girl laughingly, who prayed for nearly everybody on the face of earth. He began with the royal family and the president and his cabinet, then included all the sick and sinful in the world, followed with prayers for those listening and finally making sight, slight motion of himself. This never appealed to me, even before I knew of Christian science. God does not bless us according to the length of our petitions, nor does he bless others upon our request. We should bless the world to a far greater extent if we should think pure, healthful, and harmonious thoughts. Man should not presume to instruct God how to do his work, nor direct him what to do in order to bless this one or that one. Since God is omniscient or all-knowing, man need never advise him. You would not have me believe that my prayers for my people for these thirty years have been worthless, asked the minister. I can simply tell you what I am learning myself, returned the girl gladly, that we aid the sick only as we understand and destroy sickness as Jesus did, that we aid the sinner only as we show him his dominion over sin. We aid all mankind only as we send our thoughts of health, not sickness, of love and harmony, not sin and discord, thoughts of life, not of death. I see, I understand, he replied very thoughtfully. 
The persistent effort to put thoughts of hate, malice, jealousy, revenge, lust, self-righteousness, hypocrisy, and put all other evils out of the human mind, and to establish thoughts of love, joy, peace, purity, and meekness, is indeed the unceasing prayer, and it is establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth, concluded the scientist confidently. Then you find that claiming the possession of all good, as Miss Eddy teaches, you gain more than to ask for it, he remarked, as if to reassure himself. I want to tell you a little incident, the girl said. I am talking with a friend the other day. She questioned me as to a certain experience which I had recently. She heard that I had been in a position of great danger, and had been miraculously saved. She asked me if I did not pray then to be delivered safely. I told her I realized that God's child could not be injured, that there was no power outside of God, and nothing could therefore harm me. She was amazed as she heard this and exclaimed, How presumptuous! I would have begged God to protect me. I asked her to imagine the son of a king to be in company with those who did not recognize him. Would he beg of them not to injure him, or would he at once be conscious of his noble birthright, and assert his right and put to flight his foes? This argument was new to my friend, yet I am so sure she would admit that it caused her to think more deeply on the subject. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If we sow thoughts of fear, anxiety, doubt, discouragement, sickness, sin, and death, we must inevitably reap these in effect, whereas if we sow thoughts directly opposite to these, they will also be manifested in result. In Christian science, the sowing of spiritual thought is prayer, and the reaping is the answer. Your ideas have opened to me an entirely new line of thought, said the minister quietly. Will you tell me why in your testimonies of healing there is no mention made of the blood of Jesus which cleanses us from sin or of his death on the cross? I'm glad that you mention it, said the girl in surprise. I shall be glad to help you there. Jesus was the way-shower, the man who above all others lived and taught the truth. He healed the sick and sinful, raised the dead, and said, He that believeth on me that works that I do, shall he do also. Indeed, we are grateful to him, our example for the love, compassion, and truth which he manifested for us. But she continued, The mere blood of Jesus did nothing for mortals, even though it was shed on the cross, nor has his human blood ever cleansed one mortal from sin. But, interrupted the minister, does not the Bible say that the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses from all sin? The scripture teaches emphatically the saving efficacy of the blood of Jesus Christ. Christian science distinguishes between Christ, the eternal idea of God, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and Jesus who was born of Mary and who after a time gave up his mortal selfhood by ascending to the Father. It distinguishes between the blood of Christ and the blood of Jesus. We understand the blood of Jesus to have been the same as the blood of any other mortal, and we do not think that the blood of Jesus did anything for the salvation of the world. But Christian science teaches that the Christ is spiritual, that the Christ is the truth which heals the sick, casts out evil, and destroys sin, sickness, and death. What do you understand by the blood of Christ? questioned the man. The blood of Christ is love, life, God, and divine life expressed through Christ, is Savior of the world. I am come that ye might have life and have it more abundantly. In John's Gospel we read, Except ye eat the flesh, that is spirit and truth, of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, that is life love, ye have no truth or eternal life in you. But I do not yet understand how you believe sin to be destroyed, continued the minister. Christian science teaches that sin is never forgiven until it is destroyed in the human consciousness and entirely forsaken. The word forgive is made up of two words, give and for. Sin is forgiven only as righteousness and truth are given for, or in place of sin, and thus sin is destroyed. We are infinitely grateful to our dear Master for showing us the way to eternal happiness, peace, and immortality. But we do not look to this human personality, nor to his human blood. We look rather to his life, his deeds, his example. And likewise, we are grateful at the dear woman who has shown a sin-laden world, how Jesus healed the sick, cast out devils, and raised the dead. There it is again, said the minister, though in a very kind manner. The scientists can never talk about Christian science without mentioning Mrs. Eddy. Though, after all, I do not wonder so much if from her you learn all these wonderful things which you have been telling me about. You would not expound the Sermon on the Mount to a layman without telling him that Jesus delivered it, would you? Nor would you tell him about the Ten Commandments and omit to mention that Moses wrote them. No, the minister answered, indeed I would not, I must say. He admitted as though he knew it to be a fact that Christian scientists always have an extensive knowledge of the Bible. 
Were you always a Bible student? No, indeed, I must admit I was not, the girl replied. I presume that I had not read a dozen chapters in the Bible in my whole life until I came in the Christian science. I had often picked up the Bible to read, but somehow it always appeared so much like a history book to me, and I never did enjoy history. She added with a decided nod of the head, It made me feel sorrowful when I read, or heard read, all the beautiful works of Jesus, and believed that they could never be repeated, and what a joy when I found out that every word which Jesus uttered is practical now. Indeed, I read my Bible every day. I would not feel that I could begin my day's work without it. Mrs. Eddy has opened the scripture for us, and for that alone we owe her endless gratitude. Our hearts pulsate with love and thankfulness, so that we think of the toil, sacrifice, and hardship that has suffered for humanity's sake. She has been so misunderstood, and yes, cruelly and wickedly maligned. But, interrupted the minister, I would think that one so spiritual would be protected by the Almighty, and would be loved and honored by all. Do you forget, replied the girl, that even Jesus, the great exemplar of goodness, was persecuted from city to city and crucified? He was denied, betrayed, and deserted by the very ones whom he had toiled so hard to bless. I am glad that you told me that, replied the minister thoughtfully. I don't see why I never thought of it in the light before. I know that you will give me the scolding I deserve, he remarked hesitatingly, when I tell you that I have often thought of looking into Christian science to see how all your fruits are made possible. But something always back of me held me back when I think of a woman instead of a man being at the head of her. He might have been mistaken, yet he thought that a pained expression seemed to rest on her face for a brief moment. Looking thoughtfully at him, she said slowly, Imagine yourself in a dungeon, dark, dismal, barren, yourself cold, hungry, and wretched, bereft of all that makes life sweet. As you sit alone in pain and helplessness, want and woe, you notice that the door which opens out into your dungeon is locked, bolted and secured in almost a hundred places. So intricate are its fastening, you are positive that you could never undo them all and even as you make an attempt you find your misery increased by despair. As you stand thus helpless, so alone with the pains of hunger, thirst and death staring you in the face, suddenly you are conscious of someone telling you that there is a way out, a way to open the door and escape from the doom of death, and a way to find food, drink and joy without. You listen with heart-throbbing interest as you hear that a woman has been in the same dungeon and has found a way out, and she opened the door and found, oh, such boundless freedom and that she has left directions for opening the door for others, even as you listen, you look around your dark and death-like cell again, and your hunger and thirst grow greater. You hear of the food, drink, and shelter promised you, if you will but follow the direction given. Can it, oh, can it be true? You desperately decide to follow, no matter how tedious the work may be, but even as you start to obey, you remember with sharp regret. It was a woman who first opened the door. You would be following the teaching of a woman, were you to obey the direction given you. You sit down on the cold floor to think. If it were only a man, how gladly would you make the attempt? But you could not, no. You could not obey the teaching of a woman, even though you were sure that it would bring you the long-desired freedom. The girl had turned her face away while she was talking, and now as she turned slowly toward him, she saw that she had answered his question. His manner was humble and his voice very low as he said, The way you have spoken humiliates me in my own eyes. May I ask you to interpret in your way the little story of yours? I almost know what you will say, but I want to hear it. There is no mistaking now the glad light in the girl's eyes as she continued. The dungeon is the dark, despairing thought of mortals, when all earthly props have been wrestled from us, and the only door of death seems open to us. The door to health may be barred by material laws without number, the door to peace and happiness, alas. We dare not think what stands between us and that which we desire, as we are in this settled gloom. Someone tells us that there is a key to all these locks and barriers which separates us from our freedom. Tells us as one who was so pure, so unselfish, so attuned to divine love, that she found the way out of just such a despairing darkness. And more than that, that she has shown the way to others in order that they may partake of this spiritual food, drink from this living fountain, and find health and peace. And you would add, interrupted the minister as if to himself, that there are people who choose their misery, their arrogance and pride, rather than use the key because the door has been opened by a woman? The young girl continued, and after one had followed that dear woman, and through her teachings had unbarred the door of his dungeon, and found God's own freedom without, could he, could you, journey from this darkness to light, from suffering to peace, from ignorance to understanding, without even a thank you to her who had shown the way? Your little story has touched and humbled me, said the man. 
one would certainly be an ingrate who could refrain from giving thanks to such a one, be it a man or woman. I cannot begin to tell you what your last few words have meant to me. My very first purchase when I leave this train shall be a copy of Mrs. Eddy's book, Science and Health. I shall read it gladly, and I must confess in a much humbler attitude that I ever dreamed that I could reach. Your talk with me has given me a great desire to get this book and find out how all these things of which you have told me are possible, and I believe you when you say that one must find out for your next find out from your textbook. I can never thank you enough for your wonderful kindness and patience. The time is flying so rapidly that I have not realized the hours with which we have spent in talking. I see that I am nearing my destination. I must now leave you, he said, rising as the train stopped. I shall never forget your helpful words, and I know that we shall meet again. Looking into her face, he clasped her hand warmly, lifted his hat, and stepped from the train. The girl leaned back in her seat, rejoicing because another hungry heart would now seek the Christ truth and enter the true path to the way of life. End of book. This audio presentation of Journeying Onward by Lillian D. Waters has been brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.